Here they are, they're back again. Yep. Hey, Sheree. Hi, Michael. Hi, Hi. Ben. Hey, stranger. And there's <laughs> Mr. Doug. I'm looking forward to playing some chess with you when I come up there. Doug. I'm looking forward to my first game in about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Doug. He's feeling the pressure, yeah. And Cherie, we're talking about, uh, I teased Michael, he wants to get up here for the May event and wants to get baptized. And I said, one way or the other, we're going to get you probably going to have some good looking female driving you here and there. So we don't have just one. We have two offers <laughs> to oh, drive him nice. to the farm in May so he can be baptized here and join with us. Isn't that cool? That's beautiful. Awesome, yeah. Michael. Yeah, I think so, too. I'm hey, going to do some inviting. Hang on. Awesome. Mary Jo, good to see you back, my friend. I don't know if you can tune in or not, but Mary Jo's here, Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi, Heather. Hi. I hear you got a Bible. Yes, yes. Um, yes, I love it. It's it. I, I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying it. It's wonderful. Isn't it a great one? That's yeah, great. it's really yes. helped you. You know, describe yes. it. It's really very very helpful. I love that study yeah, I Bible. I like that version. Yes. Yeah. Well, she got the larger print too, so that it helps. And she, I, uh, I have a magnifying glass that I can read it. It's it's very good. It's I can read it very easily. Good, good. So she's been contributing a lot on the on the prayer calls during the week. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. You create, you create the spiritual monster, right? <laughs> uh, we're trying. That's right. <laughs> that's right well she talked about you know we're reading um the king james version and i don't know some people just pick that up and go on with it but man i would just like get so lost trying to figure out what they're trying to say with the language that i had to go to something different something easier and i went to a study bible many many years ago so you're going to enjoy that i have to brag on carol for a second she brought the the best dessert this morning <laughs> oh my god he hasn't shut up Carol. he's got two more pieces left of that <laughs> after the wait call. for next week yeah. wait for next week Doug. Yeah, he's savoring that 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 whatever <laughs> yeah he is yep he sure is so we had a great time in church this morning it was a yes beautiful absolutely time. Beautiful. A beautiful time. I praise the Lord for what he's doing there. And it's just uh, just growing one by one, you know, slowly growing. But the cool thing is, is the people are growing. And so it's not just the size, but the people are growing. And it's just, oh, it just excites me beyond anything. So we had a wonderful time. So let me uh, get Doug to open us up in prayer and we'll get on with it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day that you gave us here in Virginia. Lord, it was just enjoyable to go out and just feel the sun for a few hours this afternoon and rest and and just uh, reflect on this morning's message. God, we just thank you for your servant, Gracie, Lord, how humble and obedient that she is. Lord, the message that you have put on her heart, may the Holy Spirit speak through her tonight. And we just ask for your anointing, Lord, and just thank you for each precious soul that's here on this call tonight and the ones that will be listening to the message later on. God, uh, we just ask that you would speak to each of our hearts the message that you would have us individually here. And we ask all these things in your precious holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Every once in a while, i got to prove to y'all he's still putting up with me. So thank you, baby. <laughs> now, see you all. now he's going to go hide himself. Thank right? you, Doug. Yeah, he's he, he like had to get a shirt on, you know, I'm like, your shirt's fine. You just going to see it like from here. I don't know. He had to go get all uh, gussied up as we put it here at the farm. Did he comb his hair? <laughs> yeah. 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 If, <laughs> if he can find any hair, he'll comb it. I promise. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's so, so much fun to tease him. Uh, That's but one, of the, one of the things I, I tell people all the time is years ago, I, I used to use a lot of hidden shoulders. Now it's, just, this now it's just mop and glow. Meeting. Hold on, I've got to get uh, some muting going on here. <laughs> I'm going to mute everybody, and then Michael, um, you can unmute and tell us what you're going to tell us, okay? Oh, okay. Because it's, uh, I don't know where it's coming from, but you can unmute yourself. Yeah. 
Okay, you can unmute yourself. I, I said, um, I said years ago, I used to tell people that I used a lot of head and shoulders to, you know, keep the dandruff away and all that stuff. And, and now I said, all I use is mop and glow. <laughs> mop and glow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you probably can't hear Doug laughing, but he's not too far away. <laughs> and he's laughing at that. Okay, he's laughing at that. Glad you guys can can laugh. So the message obviously is entitled when you know what lies ahead. And uh, we're certainly wrapping, we're getting closer and closer to um, Easter. And so, of course, many of the messages are focused on the cross as it should be. Uh, but you know, it, I was telling this morning about how it's always puzzled me how so many people want to know what's coming right they, they, they'll have their palms read they'll read their horoscope you know they'll they want they're so hungry you know to know what's coming before it ever gets here right and so uh it, what does it look like when we know what lies ahead well no doubt about it that jesus knew what what was ahead uh, blow by blow he knew what was ahead and he did it anyway he paid the price anyway but you know if i painted a picture out there and and said, you know, we, we wonder, you know, what's coming next? So, and, and most of us wonder about dying, right? Doesn't matter how old you are, you think about dying at some point. Uh, but really, we only think about if you said, well, how do you, you know, what about death? What kind of death? You know, we would usually think about some horrific disease. Um, I rebuke that, by the way. <laughs> I plan to outlive Methuselah. But we, we think about some horrible disease. We don't think about tragic things necessarily, do we? But if I were to paint a picture and say, oh my gosh, you know, I'm driving down the road and next Thursday, I'm going to drive down the road. I'm going to get carjacked. I'm going to haul it off somewhere. I'm going to get beaten to death. Uh, oh my goodness. I, I don't want to know that, do I? We really don't want to know the details of everything when we really think about it, but Jesus did. And he was, uh, is a hundred percent God and he was a hundred percent man, right? Uh, and, but he agonized over this. You know, he he definitely paid the price. He did what he did, and we're going to go over that in just a little bit. But you know, he 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 was agonized. And in Matthew, we see uh, Matthew twenty six thirty nine. He he went a little farther, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, "Oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will." but as you will. So he's basically saying, you know, oh, take it from me. And, and he did it three times. He knew what was lying ahead. He could see it. He knew the agony he was going to endure as in the flesh. He hurt just like you hurt, just like I hurt. Okay. So even though he's all God, he certainly went through um, the years of his life here on earth and he went through it, you know, in the flesh. And so also the ones they really thought were horrible, right? Uh, and so it was commonplace. They didn't need to. But more important probably is that it was so repugnant. It was it's horrible. It was a shameful way to die. You could not possibly shame anybody anymore uh, in, uh, for their wrongdoing, if you will, than you would through crucifixion. So that's probably why. So they don't really, and the four gospels go through it a whole bunch. But there are, you know, kinds of crosses that were used that were X-shaped and T-shaped you know, all kinds of things. But, you know, what a lot of people don't know is we think we have this picture of Calvary, you know, and we and we see him up on a cross, you know, around with uh, the two thieves, right? And we think way up in the air, but in reality, they usually hung them about two feet off the ground. You see, they wanted uh, the scavenger dogs to eat the corpse. And so they just let them maul on this dead flesh. <laughs> what a horrible sight that is, right? And so, you know, we see some, uh, you know, quotes here, uh, punished with, uh, excuse me, punished with, with lead limbs outstretched, they see the stake at their fate, and they are fastened and nailed to it in the most bitter torment, evil food for birds and prey and grim pickings for dogs. Can you even imagine? Can it get any worse? You know, to be beaten and the skin ripped from your from your body and, and, and a crown of thorns and stakes through your head. Can it get any worse? But that was the end of the, of the story for them. The nails, of course, were spikes impaled, uh, you know, in through the, to the victim, right? But interesting, in 1968, um, there was a discovery uh, near Jerusalem uh, that bulldozer unearthed a, a skeletal remains of, of a man they, they called the skeleton John, um, you know, had been crucified. So they learned a lot from this discovery. Uh, and I quote, the feet were joined almost parallel, both transfixed by the same nail at the heels with the legs adjacent. The knees were doubled, the right one overlapping the left, the, the trunk was contorted, the upper limbs were stretched out, each stabbed by a nail in the forearm. 
The right tibia, the larger the two bones in the lower leg, had been brutally fractured into large, sharp slivers, perhaps to hasten his suffocation by making it virtually impossible to push himself up the, uh, the vertical beam and action required to sustain breathing. Although this theory has been challenged, it, it goes on to say, although this man was crucified through the forearm, it's possible to do so through the palm, contrary to what some have said. If the nail enters the palm through the thinner furrow, an area between the, the three bones, it breaks and no bones and it's capable of supporting several hundred pounds. So it's possible to go either way. But the bottom line is they have discovered, what, you know, validated, if you will, what took place with the crucifixion. It was horrific. You know, it was the most brutal, painful way to go. But it goes on to say here, D.A. Carson summarizes, whether tied or nailed to the cross, the victim endured countless paroxysms and pulled his arms and pushed his legs to keep his chest cavity open for breathing and then collapsed in exhaustion until the demand for oxygen demanded renewed paroxysms. So the, scour the scourging, the loss of blood, the shock of the pain all produce agony that would go on for days, ending by suffocation, cardiac arrest, or loss of blood. Now, you know, the, all of this is theorized, of course, but, you know, the, we consider that it was, uh, Jesus had not slept for 28 hours. He was purely, totally exhausted. We, we know that he was sweating blood and agony leading up to this. So he hadn't slept you know, in 28 hours, he was absolutely dehydrated uh, because he hadn't had anything to eat or drink since the last supper. And so it's theorized that probably he died of a heart attack um, on the cross. We don't know for sure, but the agony was uh, obviously horrible, right? So it's hard to imagine a more hideous uh, way to go. It's capital punishment, right? Crucifixion was believed to be an effective deterrent, you know, to keep people from committing crimes. Uh, I know that the, uh, when my son was in the Air Force and, and they were truly pitching, uh, signing up to go to Japan, they showed all these, you know, video, street videos and stuff of how it's zero crime. They're so afraid of crime, right? And they have this video of a, a, a wallet being left kind of on a ledge on a very busy street. And I mean, you couldn't miss it. And it was there, I can't remember now the amount of time, uh, days, if not weeks, nobody even touched that wallet. Why? Because they knew that, you know, if they were, you know, uh, charged with stealing, their hand would be cut off. So that's what they're looking at here is that maybe, you know, it would be so horrible, it would be a deterrent. But it's really strange that Julius Caesar was hailed as being merciful to his enemies. When he ordered, he said, just cut their throat before you hang them up there. He couldn't even stand the idea of it. Julius Caesar, are of all people, right? Uh, so, you know, he didn't like the idea of prolonging things on the cross. So it was uh, obscene and it was humiliating. Um, and it was, you know, a public symbol of indecency, right? So, it, you know, this, the, for the purpose to humiliate as much as we possibly could, it was not just intended to, uh, to break a man's body, but to crush his spirit and to defame his spirit and to spit on his grave while he's still there, right? So there, there was a whole lot behind this kind of, uh, you know, dealing with them, a kind of death. Now, they were publicly naked. Could it get any more humiliating here? Uh, it was always public, by the way, and it was always through a big crowd can you imagine gathering and people are sick who wants to gather and watch somebody be you know crucified and who wants to watch somebody die so you know to, they wanted to intensify the humiliation if you will so they were usually you know naked jewish uh they were very sensitive here with uh, the jews and they demanded that a victim wear at least a loincloth. So in the Bible, physical nakedness was a symbol of spiritual shame. And John Calvin writes this, the evangelists portray the son of God as stripped of his clothes that we may know the wealth gained for us by his nakedness, for it shall dress us in God's sight. God willed his son to be stripped that we should appear freely with the angels in the garments of his righteousness and fullness of all good things, whereas formerly uh, foul disgrace and torn clothes kept us away from the approach to heaven. The first Adam originally created in the righteousness of God by his sin stripped us naked. The last Adam suffering the shame of nakedness by his obedience uh, clothed us in the righteousness of God. Interesting quote from John Calvin, right? Now the cross was forbidden for Romans. You know, the shame associated with it with crucifixion was so incredible, so intense, uh, that it was actually expressly forbidden that a Roman citizen be executed in that manner whatsoever. Can you even imagine it? It was so repulsive to them that they didn't want it for their own people. But again, the four gospels give an account of the crucifixion, but 
In John 19, 31, 34, it details are recorded that don't appear in the other three. And so here we go. Then the Jews, since it was a day of preparation, and so that the bodies might not remain on the cross the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day was a great Sabbath, requested a pilot that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. They would have rushed things along, right? So the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man and the other man who had been crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he had already died, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately there came out blood and water. And so the Roman soldiers, you know, uh, they wanted to, again, rush things along. Enough is enough. You know, when's the, you know, how long is this person going to wail around on a cross, right? And so they would usually break their legs to rush along because they couldn't support their body anymore, and they would suffocate that way. But why is that uh, so important? What, what's, the, what's the deal about piercing his side and blood and water coming out? Well, the de Jesus' death opened two fountains to meet all of our needs, a fountain for washing away our sins and a fountain of life. Isn't that beautiful? Zechariah 13, 1 says, in that day, there will be an open fountain for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. And Psalm 36, 9 says, for with you is the fountain of light, life, your light, we see light. Isn't it beautiful? So we think about that, the blood and the water. But listen, every day we draw nearer to death, don't we? I don't want to know when mine is. I'm not thinking anytime soon, right? Because I, 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 I just thank God every day for vibrancy, for health, for clarity of mind. I'm going to keep serving him till the day I die. But every day we draw nearer. And most of us, you know, we don't want to think about how necessarily outside of a lot of people worry about sickness, right? Uh, we sometimes wonder when it'll be, but most of us don't wonder how it'll be. You know, we assume a lot of things, but we don't really want to know. But what if we did know how we were going to die? What if we were like Jesus and you knew how you were going to die and when you're going to die? What if we knew we would be tortured and tormented? Would we go ahead with that, right? Jesus knew what he was going to face. That's my point. He knew it. He understood the pain and the agony on the horizon. And he did ask his father, please, if, you, if it's your will, may I take it from me. But Jesus wasn't a victim. We often paint this picture of him being a victim. I mean, he was brutalized, no doubt about it, right? But he wasn't a victim. He did it for victory, for your victory and my victory. He took one for the team, if you will, right? So he's not, should not be looked at as some poor martyred victim. He should be looked at as the Christ, the King, uh, that, that showed us the way to victory. So again, he's fully God, but also fully human. And he, and he was, you know, just agonizing over this. So Jesus said to his disciples, you know, spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And, 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 and praying, he says, let this cup pass from me, right? He was, he was battling with it. He knew exactly what was coming. He was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And so would you be, and so would I be. The difference is we'd go running off like horses if we had a chance, right? We would be disobedient. But Jesus knew what was to come, and there was only one way to accomplish the goal. He knew he had to face it, the agonizing physical torture. Uh, it would be a spiritual and emotional torture as well. But he knew God's will was, uh, you know, it, to crush him, to allow him to be pierced for our transgressions. It had to happen, and he was willing to pay the price for you and for me. So he was victorious over death to show us what's possible for those who believe, right? Without him, we'd have no hope. I don't even want to think about it. Uh, you know, it, it is, it, he was prepared a home for us. And one day our suffering will end forever. Whatever that suffering is, whether it's physical, emotional, uh, all the above, right? It's all going to end. Hallelujah. We know that there's an end. We know what lies ahead for us, for those who believe, right? We're comfortable. We know that. And we're so grateful, especially this time of year, as we reflect on the price he paid. But not everybody's going to share that victory. And unless we share with them, they don't know what lies ahead. You see, his suffering, and I don't mean to, to, to downplay it at all, right? But he, he suffered beyond our imagination, but only for a short while. You know, he from approximately 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., he was tortured. He was tortured to death, no doubt about it. But you know what? Hell is for eternity. And yet we, we know what lies ahead for those people who don't believe. And you know what we do? We excuse them. We ignore them. We pretend like they've got it going on. We'll make every excuse in the book not to talk to them. Or we just completely don't even, it doesn't even hit our radar. How in the world 
can we know what lies ahead? We're, we're good with our own walk, right? We know what we've got going on. Yes, we're victorious. But what about all those other people? You know, narrow is the gate. There are lots of people that we can't take that chance of wondering if they are, assuming they are. Well, I took them to Sunday school when they were five years old. It doesn't matter. Do they know him? Uh, uh, you know, intimately? Do they have a relationship with them? And if not, what lies ahead for them is horrible. So I'm taken from a, a recent study that we did, and it was on, uh, you know, heaven and hell, basically. And I just want to look at what lies ahead for those people as we face this season of the year where we're just so thankful for the gift and the price that was paid for us. Can we remember those who don't know? So we, the 23 Minutes in Hell is a, is a great read, by the way. Um, we'll have a discussion around the table this afternoon with Doug and a friend of ours. And, and I was saying that, yeah, I do believe that God opens up these realms. Uh, for some people have seen heaven, many people actually, some have seen hell, just so that they can tell us, you know, what they've seen. I do believe that. But nonetheless, what this man writes is biblical. It has foundation there. Not like he made up weird stuff that we don't read about in the Bible. He just experienced it. So there were stone walls and bars. It was filthy, stinking, dirty prison, like a dungeon. You could stop right there. Now, nobody, my worst enemy, would I wish into a filthy, stinking, dirty prison like a dungeon. Isaiah 24, 22 says, and they should be gathered together as prisoners or gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell, to the chambers of death, where chambers means, you know, inner rooms, if you will. And Job 17, 16, they should go down to the bars of the pit. So it is a, a downward a spiraling down, right, to a dirty, filthy, stinking prison. But you know what? It doesn't go on from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. This is going to go on forever and ever. Amen. For the people who don't have what you and I have. The first thing, uh, you know, he says I noticed was the intense heat. Man, you know, we, we, we joke, it's not funny, but, you know, I don't like hot, okay? I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I want some cool air somewhere. I don't like it. But we're talking about some intense heat here, the worst kind of heat you've ever felt in your life. You know, maybe you got too close to a a, a fireplace or a stove, any kind of fire, you're like, oh, uh, you know, this is intense heat. And it's so far beyond the ability to sustain life. So if it were really in a physical sense, not just a spiritual sense, you wouldn't be able to sustain life. And he says, I wondered how I, be, how I could be alive in this place. You know, I wanted to get up and I tried to move. And it took so much effort. There was no strength in my body. So now you are thrown down into a pit, a dungeon, a filthy, stinking prison. The, the heat is intense and there's no strength in your body. Can't even move. Isaiah 11, 14, 9 through 10 says, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at the coming. Uh, they would say, art thou become weak as we? And Psalm 88, 1 says, I am counted with them who go down into the pit. I am as a man who has no strength. One of the things you endure in hell for all eternity is you're completely void of physical strength. You're just like a slug, right? Got to put up with it. In him, we live and move and have our being. Even mo uh, movement comes from God. It's not automatic. So here you are, you're in the dungeon, you got the heat going on, you have absolutely no strength, you're stuck. He says, I looked up and I saw these two enormous creatures in the cell. So he's in a cell here with horrific, evil, awful things. They were demons pacing like vicious caged animals. One was reptile-like in appearance with bumps and scales. It had a huge jaw and sunken eyes and claws that were like a foot long. These particular ones were about 12 or 13 feet tall. You ever known scared in your life? The, the guys, this is real stuff, okay? And this is what lies ahead for those people who don't believe. They were blaspheming and cursing God. They had extreme hatred for God. So we know that blasphemy comes from the demonic realm. So here they are, right? And, 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 and he's stuck with them and they hate him because they hate God. And they're blaspheming the very God that in this case, the man didn't know and love. Uh, they directed that hate they had for God toward him. And he says, I wondered why, what, what have I done to these creatures? Uh, the one demon picked me up, threw me into the wall, and my bones broke. All their bones broke, right? I collapsed on the floor. I couldn't believe what was happening to me. And he says, why am I not dead? 
the the other demon picked him up and guess what he did he tore his flesh open isn't that uh, interesting that that's exactly what happened to christ right breaking the bones and tearing the flesh uh, but it was like he said like ribbons and matthew 10 28 says fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell that's what's to be feared right so remember luke 16 and the rich man he he lifted his eyes up and and all he wanted was lazarus man give me one drop of water to cool my tongue there is no water so in hell you hunger but there's no food and you thirst and there's no water you can't possibly wish your worst enemy the worst person that you could possibly imagine into a place like hell he says i noticed there was no blood or water coming from my wounds and but leviticus 17 11 says the life of the flesh is the blood well there's no life in hell so there's no blood in hell it's just pain and agony uh zechariah 9 11 by prisoners out of the pit where there is no water there's not one drop of water in hell and guys remember this doesn't go on for a few hours this is the eternity the eternal picture for those people you know people i know that don't know okay so and then uh, about them it all went dark pitch dark but darker than anything you have ever seen in your life so here you are it's stinky you're in a you're in a cell you've got two 12 13 feet demons there tearing your flesh breaking your bones you you have no strength there's nothing left right it's now it's utterly dark all darkness uh and it said he said you could literally feel the darkness and then i was taken to a large pit of fire and psalm 11 6 says upon the wicked he will rain fire and brimstone and horrible tempest matthew 13 49 says angels will serve the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into the furnace of fire so there are so many scriptures about fire it's the real deal right but can you imagine you take taken to this fire now the the, the thing that i think sometimes it's hard for us to grasp is that in heaven and in hell we're aware okay it's it's everlasting it's eternal so the physical uh, obviously the physical aspect changes when we go to heaven we have a, a a new body right right now we're just a soul with a package and we get a new package but in hell it's still everlasting you're aware of your surroundings forever and ever and ever and so this man is tormented by watching people thrown into the fire pit and hearing screams for the forever for all of eternity, you have to endure that. So death doesn't mean that we cease to exist. It, it means that we all have an eternity. I know my eternity. I pray you know your eternity. Hell is eternal separation from God. I said this morning that, you know, we look out at this dark world and we think, oh my gosh, how, how bad can it get? It can get a whole lot better. Because right now you're seeing a world that still has God in it. And you're seeing a, a, a world that has the remnant in it. There's still, you know, some beautiful uh, aspects of life, you know, because of God. But, you know, hell is eternal separation, nothing good. But you still exist and you got to live in the darkness and you got to live with the heat and you got to live with the screaming and live with the torture forever. Isaiah 57, 21, there's no peace saith my god to the wicked there's no peace of mind of any kind in hell there are 49 scripts that talk about where the current hell is or sheol is located um there's two i'm offering two just tonight ezekiel 26 20 then i will bring you down with those who go down to the pit to the people of long ago i will make you dwell in the earth below as in ancient ruins with those who go down to the pit and you will not return or take your place to the land of the living and then in number 16 and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households and all those associated with Korah, together with their possessions, they went down alive into the realm of the dead with everything they owned. The earth closed over them and they perished and were gone from the community. It's very clear that it's deep, deep, deep. It's a, it's a physical place, if you will, that we go. And then there were different levels of torments and degree, uh, degrees of punishment. Just like, by the way, there'll be different levels of reward in heaven. Not everybody is going to have a front row seat reigning with Jesus Christ. Some people, as I said this morning, are going to make it into the pearly gates by the skin of their teeth. So there's different levels and rewards. And in hell, there are different levels of torment and degrees of, of punishment that's there. And again, the stench of hell is so foul and putrid. The worst odors you can possibly imagine. And just remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits. So there's a, that smell of sulfur. Sulfur is just another word for 
brimstone. So you remember, and I unfortunately I probably remind you of it a little bit sometimes, but the fire and brimstone messages, uh, you know, frankly have a purpose. And that purpose is to remind us that you've got a choice in this life. And that choice that you make is an everlasting, eternal consequences. The choice to either follow Jesus with everything you've got, or the choice is that you find your way into hell. Revelation 14, 11 says, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest, nor, not day or night. So we know that Jesus hadn't rested for 28 hours when he was tortured and put to death, right? You've ever had, I'm sure, sleepless nights, you're exhausted. You do anything to get some sleep, you in hell, you don't ever get any rest. Now, that primarily means no rest in the torment, but no rest of any kind. Isaiah 57, 20 says, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea is always moving. Think about it, it never stops, right? It just keeps on and on and on. So rest is a blessing from God. Every time you're able to rest, whether it's just sitting down, taking a few minutes and reflecting like we did today outside in the sun or or it's going to sleep at night. It's a blessing from God. It's got a purpose to restore you. And the Bible says that he counsels us even in our sleep. And so it's a blessing. Psalm 127 two says the Lord gives his beloved sleep, right? So in hell, you're not his beloved. You're not getting any rest. You're not getting any sleep. Then, at, you know, standing next to the large pit of fire, he could see demons that were shoving his people in. People were burning. They were helpless. They were weak, just like he was. They couldn't fight him off. And the torment goes on and on. It's so dark. Uh, it consumes all the light. And then he says, I was standing in a bed of maggots. I hope you're getting sick, by the way, at this point. Solid maggots crawling all over everything. It can't get any worse, okay? And remember, Jesus said, where their worm does not dies not. And, and he uses the word maggot. And people have them crawling all over them. Uh, and it's disgusting. But this the, the, the person who visited hell, God gave this vision, wanted everybody to get as clear a vision as they could. Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and the worm will cover thee. And again, there's that word maggot in the original Hebrew. If a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, you know, when the flesh is consumed from the animal, the maggots die. But that's why Jesus said where their worm dies, not maggots aren't going anywhere, right? Because the flesh, uh, you know, ceases to exist. And then you're hungry, but you can't eat. You're thirsty, you can't drink, you can't rest, you have no strength. It goes on and on and on. That seems like a, a bizarre picture to be painting for you as we approach Easter, doesn't it? As we think about our Savior and what he endured on our behalf. Without him, we have no hope. If he hadn't paid the price, he, he, I couldn't be redeemed, right? But, you know, I can't help but think, as we, they say that less than 10% of us ever share the gospel with another human being. Oh, we might be good about saying, bless you, or God bless you, or I'll pray for you. We might be good about those things, but do we ever follow through with the great commission that we've all been given, every single one of us, right? And that is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's to disciple people. It's to make disciples of the nations. That's my job and it's your job. And you know what? If you're not doing it, you're going to answer for it more ways than one. But you can't help but think, or I can't help but think, that in some ways, you know, it almost seems like we'd look at this cross, we'd look at the price, and we refuse to tell anybody what lies ahead, what lies ahead if you know Jesus, and what lies ahead if you don't. We refuse to do it. And it's almost like uh, spitting in the face of our Lord by not sharing it, right? We're sharing only the good stuff, the Easter eggs and all the new life and celebrating uh, the resurrected Christ. Of course we will. We always will. But you know, there's only a, few, a, a small number of us that actually will. There's a lot more people out there, you know, that are destined to go to that awful place. And, you know, frankly, we answer for those things. So, Again, you know, we, we won't sit in the judgment seat and, and pay for our sins. He died for our sins. We don't have to walk around with shame in our life. He died for our shame. But we will have to answer for missed opportunities. So when he says to me, Lynn, you remember that person in the grocery store? And, you know, you had a few minutes of time and you talked about the price of eggs and you never shared me. I'm going to pay for that. And so, guys, every opportunity we have. But, you know, as my kids uh, grew up and they were leaving the nest and as each one went out, I, I spent time in prayer, probably drove them crazy, by the way. But I always pray for them. But I spent serious time in prayer and over them, you know, in, in their journey. They're now leaving the nest. And, and my job in that regard is done. Right. And to each one I read and we talked about this.
this scripture. Therefore, my dear friends, I would say, therefore, my dear son or my dear daughter, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue on your work, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Guys, we're not on easy street, okay? It's fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and, and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the skies as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. So this was my way of talking to my children and saying, you know, keep on with it. I've, I've given you living waters. I, I, I have done everything to, to, to help you walk out your salvation, to teach you the way, to lead you the way. And now you're leaving the nest, work it out with fear and trembling so that all my, I did not labor in vain. Well, I can't help, but and, and with all respect, by the way, but think about Christ as we celebrate the victory, the victor, right? That again, we, we have no hope. We have no future without him. As we celebrate him this time of year, I, I want each one of us, maybe to have painted a picture in your mind. You think about how oh, far too few people are able to celebrate the resurrected Christ. They don't even know the resurrected Christ. But worse than that, because we're not telling them, they don't know what lies ahead. See, we're good. We're, we're golden, right? We know that no eye has seen, no ear has heard what he has in store for us. We can't even imagine what he has in store, the goodness. He's gone to prepare a place for us. We know what we get in heaven. We know what lies ahead. And most of us won't die a torturous death to get it, right? He's already paid it. But how many people are in your life? How many people maybe you work with? How many people may be family members? Or maybe it's your own children that you can't bring yourself to think that they might not know Jesus. Listen, we can't afford to take a risk right now, okay? We can't afford to play games. Now, we can talk till the cows come home about the time being near. I, no doubt the Lord has put a burden on my heart for lost people. No doubt that I'm like that watchman on a hill. And you probably get sick of hearing it because I'm just like, wake up, wake up, wake up. No doubt about that, right? But that time is near. And you can't go wrong if you live like the time is right now. You know, so you can believe what you believe. I believe the time is near. And I know that if, if, if I believe that the time was way out there, I'm going to live like it's way out there. And if I believe the time is now, I'm going to live like it's right now, which means I care about the destiny, the soul of everyone God puts in my life. So as we look at this season, as we celebrate the resurrected Christ, I pray with every fiber of my being that you have it within your heart to care about people who don't know Jesus. And you know what? Stop guessing. So if you say, well, I think they do. I mean, we were in Sunday school together. Just, you need to be sure they do. And you know what? You don't go. You don't have to be unkind. In fact, don't ever be unkind. But it's not so hard to figure out where people are with Christ. And so, guys, listen, you better get on with it. And as we face that, when we, we again, we celebrate the resurrected Christ, don't you, don't ever take for granted and forget the gift that you've been given with your salvation. You've been, you're a, cho a chosen child of the living God, and you got a job description. So we celebrate him, and there could never be a better time for us to go out and share with the lost world, share with our lost ones, what lies ahead for those who believe and what lies ahead for those who don't. And that's it for me. Does anybody out there have anything to share? Okie dokie, my crickets. Ooh, ooh. Oh man, and the Uzi preacher, you did it again. <laughs> did I, I hit was... you with both barrels? Oh man, uh, oh man, automatic. It was automatic. But I, you know, if I wasn't, if I wasn't born again, I, you have, you would have scared the hell out of me. So. <laughs> that's the, <a, laughs> that's the goal, and, right? Yeah, uh, that's right. Man, if we can get get you at this message. We can get, I want, I'd like a copy of this. If we can get this message on social media and get it in front of everybody, we know, oh my goodness, uh, what a witness. So great job, great job.
Thank you so much. Well, we will do that. We will get it out there and pray. I pray each week as we do these. And by the way, uh, my brother David is the reason that any of these hit social media because we used to gather and I would record and I would share if y'all wanted to see it again, but I never put it on social media. And one day my brother said that that's not right. There's somebody out there needs to hear and it's a perpetual message basically. And so he's the reason I did. It's been an amazing experience for me since I did that. So I thank him for that. Anybody else? It's a, it's a definitely not your average Easter message, <laughs> but ain't nothing average about me anyway. So that's all right. Anybody else have anything? Oh my goodness. Heather, you're, you're muted out. If you're talking, honey, unmute. I can't hear you. You know how to unmute? There you go. Yeah. I just, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I got emotional. I got charged. I, I felt, I felt the message. Good. Good. Thank you for sharing that. You know, we have so much to celebrate, but guys, there's so much work to do. There's so much work to do. I, I, I listen, I've, I've had, uh, you know, experiences, horrific experiences, like I'm sure you guys have people that you didn't want to forgive and all kinds, but and nobody you could ever tell me about that I would wish into hell. And so, you know, we, we've got to do our part. And, you know, unfortunately, the churches have gotten away from really, really strong messages. And, you know, we don't want to offend people. We don't want to upset people. And consequently, that's the way people are living. They're, they don't know that there are consequences to everything. And so yeah. that's up to us. It's up to us to love them into restoration or to love them into salvation, right? It's up to us with that kindness and compassion, you know, that, that, we, that is possible with Christ. But it's our job. It's our job to do that. And we haven't been doing it. So again, as we celebrate the most beautiful time of the year, um, I want us all to re be reminded of what a gift we have and what a job we have to do. So I'm glad it moved you, my friend. Anybody else? You have opened my eyes so much to, the, to what life after death could be. Mm -hmm. And so many times that I would think, Oh, I'll just go to confession and everything will be fine. You know, being Catholic. And uh, yes, the Lord is a forgiving Lord, but he also expects us to uh, do the right thing. And um, thank him. you so much. For, people him. don't talk about this. It's not that you want to hear it every single day, but we need to hear it every single day. We need yeah. to be reminded that there are consequences. That's right. And uh, and that's where fear and trepidation can come in. I've heard the words many times. Yeah. But hearing the words and really drinking it in, mm -hmm. it, it brings a new meaning to uh, to Easter. Yes, it mm -hmm. does. Thank you for that, my friend. Yes, it does. Thank you. And, you know, I, I don't know where this whole, um, I don't know, fairy tale kind of journey of faith came from except maybe we withheld you know too much truth and the, and the hard things you know from people for so long but but it's clear work out your salvation with fear and tremble you already say what you fearful and trembling about right you already what does it mean it means that it's not that simple okay it's not that simple i used to say about kids if anybody told you that you would be you know just just consumed by these people for the rest of your life Nobody would have kids, you know, you think they're going to grow up and fly away, never gonna, but you still worry and you still fret, but it's the same, same way with your salvation, right? You don't just get your ticket punch and go to sleep. It doesn't work that way. What he wants is your heart. And I can tell you that when, if you love him the way we're supposed to love him, you would be fearful and tremble when you know you've, you've, you've sinned against God. Every sin that we ever do is against God, right? You, you would go to repentance and, and, and ask for forgiveness immediately. You wouldn't have to be bugged about it because you love him so much. You don't want to be anything between you and God, right? 
So it is a fear and trauma. It's not as simple. It's not this fairy tale thing. And and I've said until I know people get sick of hearing this too, but it's like we're supposed to be so in love with him. He should be number one in our life. And when you're in love, it shows. Okay? You can't quit talking about that person. You want everybody to meet that person. You can't get enough time with that person. Doesn't that sound like the journey of faith and how it should be with Jesus Christ? But somehow we've gotten relaxed. That complacency set in. And that lukewarm church is just predominantly, you know, all across the world, really. That lukewarm church that he says, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Well, there are, there's a whole lot more people than just me that are saying, we better wake up. I love you enough to say, we need to wake up. I love you enough to tell you that. And, you know, a lot of people, what, what do we read? When the Bible says on that day, he'll say, I never knew you. Get away from me. And these were busy people. Lord, didn't we heal in your name? Did we cast out demons in your name? These are busy church people, as we call them, right? And he says, I never knew you. So they stayed busy, but they weren't in love. And we better be in love with Jesus. So, happy so happy. thank you, Ben. Thank you for um, your truth and, and being strong to share this message. Um, it, hits, it hits me. It hits, it hits home. And um, thank you for being obedient and um, this is a beautiful message. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Well, you're a beautiful friend. You're a beautiful sister in Christ. And uh, that's what it's all about, right? We're supposed to spur one another on. And so this is, me, I get spurred. Whatever the Lord brings for me to share with you, he already took me to the woodshed over. Okay? So if there's any consolation in that, knowing I've already been beaten up, then when you get beat up, then I feel sorry for you. Joyce, how are you doing, my friend? You got something? Uh, yeah, you know, Lynn, I just wanted to share with you, you really know that God is moving when the same thing comes out of different people's mouth. That's right. And just this morning, my pastor was saying this very same message and, and how disappointed, even though we are a church, how disappointed he is in the church. And um, we're actually going to be going in the middle of downtown Hammond and having Easter Sunday church outside downtown Hammond so oh, uh, but he's saying the same thing you know we we have to get out we are the church we are the church. we have to get out and share with everybody we come in contact with that's right and that's how we're going to bring souls to Christ it's not about what you look like when you walk in a building it's it's finding those broken people that's and right. loving them back to life amen praise the Lord for your pastor and thank you for sharing that. And, and, and that's so true. I, I, I've commented that a couple of times. It's, it almost gets strange, you know, because the Lord gives you a message and you share it. And you're like, oh, my gosh, everybody's saying the same thing. <laughs> you know, it's he's speaking to his people through his people. Yes. And this is a predominant message that you'll hear out there. And guys, enough is enough. Enough yes. is enough. We have got to do what we were created to do. And yes. as we look at how challenging life is and all the things going on, listen, again, I was born for such a time as this. And, yes, so you. and so were you. So it's time to armor up and get out there yes. and do what we're supposed to do. If we're passionate for the Lord, that's what we'll do. Yes. People don't know. They don't know. Thank yes. you. Chris. I love you, girl. I'm so glad to see you here tonight. Yeah. Hope you'll make it to the farm here, May. It's all right around the corner. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Y'all get up here. I'll tell you. And we got baptism. Michael's one. I'm going to get baptized. Got four or five uh, baptism already lined up. I'm very excited about that to be baptized. But, you know, uh, it, as you were talking, Joyce, about, you know, I, I think that's one thing, you know, when the Lord first started moving this whole barn thing, uh, it was a supernatural thing. You know how it hit Earl's heart to, to yes. work on and to get the power team together. And I'm just like <laughs> along for the ride. I did not have that vision. I did not make those plans. God did that to yeah. Earl, right? What a beautiful thing. But because it's so humble, yes. it's just a, it, it's just so humble in there. Uh, it touches those hearts, right? It's a beautiful it, thing. But it does. I, I just want to add ahead. one more thing, you know, it's like when you do what you do and what you've done for so many years, 
your passion and your heart to share the gospel with people. And, you know, this year, has, that's been my focus. And he has restored all of the broken relationships in my life in this one year. And, you know, it's you never know what he's going to do to you surrender and serve him fully and watch what he does. Amen to that. Well, hallelujah. And, and praise the Lord for restored relationships. Michael was sharing the same kind of thing in his family before we got going. He, he, he wants them all restored. Yes. You know, when you think about every broken, I was just doing, uh, doing this in my own heart for a situation in my family just a, a couple of days ago. You know, when you look at it, you know, every single broken relationship, it all comes down, you know, to a lack of forgiveness. Yes. It always is. Yes. Right. And, and was, listen, he went to that cross and, and to forgive all of us of our junk. Who are we to say, I'm not going to forgive you of yours. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, so it's that restoration thing. It's a beautiful thing. He can do all things. He wants all families restored. Yes, he does. Especially with his people. My goodness gracious. What a shame it is when people carrying a Christian trump card can't forgive somebody. Can you really? (laughs) I'm going to introduce you to the guy on the cross and talk to you about forgiveness. You can't forgive? And look what he went through, what he endured, and knowing what was lying ahead. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Joyce. I'm so happy. Uh, Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Uh, Lynn? Yes, Michael. I, I was just going to say your your description of hell, if that doesn't terrify the living daylights out of people, just, just the description alone as to what right. you have to go through. For, and all you get you know, for the only reason is that you're not loving God and you're not serving him. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd have to be out of your cotton picking mind <laughs> right. to put up, you know, to to go in a place like that, to put up with the, you know, the tortures that you would have to right. go through uh, for that, especially yeah. when you look at what God, what Jesus already has done. Right. on the cross and right. and the tortures he already went through for us and in our name and for our life expectancy and then how can we not forgive it's like it's like my grandson said when when he called me and said he was going to um, reconnect with his grandmother he said at some point you have to be able to forgive you know you have to be able to let it all go and forgive people Mm -hmm. because people are just people that's right and um and um and i'm i'm really really proud of them for you should be being able to see that and and you know the fact that he's grown to um such a good man, you know, when, mm-hmm. when you look at where he started out. You know. Well, that's that. I love that. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. And that's where that humility comes in, right? Because it's pride that keeps us from forgiving. But when we're humble, when we realize how God, <laughs> we see ourselves the way God saw us and loved us anyway. We see ourselves as God sees us. Uh, boy, you know, how can you walk around and not forgive somebody else what they did? Look at yourself. Get the plank out of your own eye, right? Get it out of your own eye. But yeah, so it's a it's a beautiful thing, and I think it's another sign of him coming soon, right? He's 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 already a, and I don't want to get in a political thing. I I won't do that ever. But you know, when you look at all that we went through in a few years, uh, and, and under the guise of you know vaccines and whatever, right? Really, if you dig through all that junk, what you really saw was a sifting of the church. You, you can see where God separated the sheep from the goats. Who, who's going to stand strong? Who's going to fold? You, you see it, right? And so I think that's one sign, for my heart at least, uh, you know, that he, he, he's getting the church ready. He's getting it ready. Enough is enough is enough. We have gone too long building mega churches 
where we're so afraid to speak truth because somebody might not put a few bucks in offering plate. We have soft sold the, the gospel uh, uh, under a um, seeker sensitive label. And you know what? Uh, if we quit preaching hellfire and damnation. We quit telling people the consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death. And it's torturous in hell for all of eternity. So again, as we give thanks for the Savior who died on that cross, what he endured, you know, we wouldn't. I'd be running like a wussy, right? But he did, knowing what, was the, what lies ahead. He did it for us. He's our Savior, but he was also fully man at that time, right? He felt pain just like you and I would. But how in the world, as we think through every time, you know, especially as we're heading toward this Easter season, when you think about that, you think about anybody in your life that you think, well, I think they're, I think they know Jesus. It's not a birthright, guys. <laughs> they either do or they don't, right? Mm -hmm. I hope you think about hell and the fact that because of your salvation, you're not going there. And the fact that each one of us has been given the same job description, we need to do our job. And our job is to tell people about the wages of sin, about the, the risen king, about our hope and our redeemer and the consequences for rejecting him. That's what I hope for you for Easter, not just pretty Easter bunnies. And so if there's, is there anything else, guys, before we pray us out? Okay, let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we love you. Oh, how we love you, Lord. And we just thank you as we approach this season, Lord, that where we pause to give thanks and we remember the horrific way uh, that you endured the, the, the agony, the torture, and all that you did, knowing what lies ahead. But you saw victory and you knew the only way to redeem us was to do what you did, Lord. We thank you for it. We thank you for it through all of eternity. But Lord, I just pray that each heart has been pierced. Each heart that hears this later on will be pierced, Lord, to get down to business and to get back to telling people the, the whole gospel truth, not just about uh, Jesus at Easter time and Easter eggs, Lord, but the whole thing and the consequences for those who don't believe. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would want to be like the watchman on the hill saying it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. The king is coming, and it, but sooner rather than later. So Lord, I just pray, God, that we'll spur one another another on that I'm so thankful for the people in my life that you have spur me along Lord and I'm thankful to be uh, found worthy as a usable vessel to spur others on Lord so we love you so much in the mighty name of Jesus we give it to you amen and amen, amen. I love Thank you guys you know where to find me if you're still speaking to me <laughs> if I haven't stepped on your toes too much <laughs> you know where to find me okay I'll see you next time Take care. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.